Bible reading is John 3. I'm actually going to read from verse 13 to 21. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 13. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. This is God's word. Well, what a wonderful service we've been able to enjoy uh, so far. I hope you got your Bibles open. Uh, Tonight we're in John chapter 3, and as we come to hear God's word, let me uh, just pray. And if you, in your hearts, if you can pray along with me and ask God uh, to really bless the remainder of this time that we may hear from him. So please join in with me uh, in your hearts as we pray. Father, we uh, give you praise for what we have seen tonight. Uh, It's not not a display of great people, it's the display of a great God. And so we worship you. And Lord, now we come to a time where we open up the holy book, your word, the very means by which change these four individuals. And now, God, we've come to worship by listening to you, to hear what you would have to say for us. We know that The words contained here are powerful to change, change lives, change history, change the world. But Father, may you even start just with this room tonight. May you prepare every heart and may you speak so clearly to us. Guard us from distractions, guard us from looking at others. And we pray that we'd see something of Jesus tonight. Father, show us yourself and we pray for the help of the Holy Spirit as we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just reflecting uh, back to my school days and thinking, what were the most significant points, and same for you, most significant points of our school education? As I was looking back, it wasn't trigonometry and it wasn't algebra. That is not what has helped me today. Uh, I think it's probably not what helped uh, most of us. Looking back, it wasn't the study of poetry in English and it wasn't studying Shakespeare. What was, it, what was it that has helped me to live in this world, to be who I am and to be able to function? It was the ABCs, the building blocks of words that I would use for the rest of my life to be able to communicate and learn. It was the learning of numbers, of addition and subtraction, which stick with me to this day and help me function and live in this world. No doubt, you just read along with Will, arguably the most famous words in all of Christianity. Rich people know it, poor people know it, adults know it, and many of your children know it off by heart. John 3.16, the ABCs. It is said the whole world of Christianity, all of Christianity is summed up in this one little verse. It is a treasure mine. And so we can look to do all these things in Christianity. 
But you need to come back to the ABCs and see that this, John 3, 16, Christianity in a nutshell, is what affects all of life. It's made us who we are. It's the reason for the destination that we're heading. So I don't know about you, but I haven't heard many sermons on John 3, 16. <laughs> it's often left for the kids. So let's trust that the Lord would speak so clearly to us tonight. If you're following along i've got a few points tonight the first one we see in the verse is love's surprising object love's surprising object the beginning of verse 16 for god so loved the world now we are first drawn to the author of love scripture tells us that god is love it's in his very nature so love permeates all that he does because it permeates all that he is. All of God's actions and all of his works are permeated and driven by love. So even when you read of those nasty things about his judgments, they're done in love because God loves the truth. God loves what is right. God loves to preserve his honor. And this God, it says, so loved. So when you read the opening verse of the Bible... It says, in the beginning, God. The Bible starts off with God. And here, love has its origin in God. For God so loved. Love doesn't begin with us. It doesn't originate with us. And we see here, he loved. That is a verb. He loved. God doesn't just have a feeling of love. Love isn't something that just comes upon him and he feels it in his stomach. Rather, God expresses love. God demonstrates love. God shows love. God displays love. And he gives it. And we see this love lavished from the very beginning of history. Love is lavished. What kind of world does God create us? When you look at creation, he creates a kind of wonderland, as it were. He doesn't create this kind of dull earth that is just merely adequate for us to survive. He creates this extraordinary earth. It's vibrant. It's beautiful. It is breathtaking. It is rivers and valleys. It is mountains and plains. It is stunning and it's filled with every kind of color. Even the garden that he originated with, it was a paradise for people. Every tree for fruit to eat, not just to survive, but to enjoy and delight and to find shade and refuge in. And still today, the God who lavishes doesn't just let us live, but he gives us happiness, joy, marriage, a family, success, victories, so much enjoyment, the seasons, the sunshine and the rain. His love is lavished. Now, how, how utterly different is the true God to the false gods in pagan history? How, how different is he? Now, history is filled with records of the innumerable pagan gods out there. You can't count them. There's too many. History is full of them. But what were they like? They, they were vindictive. They were ruthless. They were brutal. They were cruel. They could sit back indifferently at the suffering of humanity. They cared not for justice. That didn't matter to them. And they were manipulative. When you look at the gods of the pagan world, they represent the worst of humanity. And you can tell that man has invented them because they personify all of our worst traits. And this is about, like, so you, you read back in history, for example, of the god Molech. And, and how was he to be worshipped? The people sacrificed their children through fire to him, to try and please him, so that he would turn his attention to them. That was the kind of god that he was. And then you've got the god of Baal and his servants, those who were prophets, in order to get his attention, they would slash themselves so that their blood was flowing out, just so that he would look to them or maybe show an interest in them and act when people needed him. 
And then you have the more modern tragedy. Say, for example, in India, how many babies have been thrown in the river Ganges to the Hindu gods to drown in order to get the gods' attention so that they might just look upon us and consider intervening or providing? This is what the gods like. So, so the reality of a loving God who is in himself love is completely foreign to the pagan world. Completely strange concept. But more striking than that, who God is, it is the object of his love. That is the shocking part of it. For God so loved the world, it says. Now, John 3.16 if, the, if this verse was placed at the very introduction of the Gospel of John, it would completely be stripped of its grandeur. But the Holy Spirit doesn't put it at the beginning of the Gospel. He puts it a little bit further on. Because when it says God so loved the world, God has already told us at the beginning of the Gospel what this world is like. What did he say in chapter 1, verse 10? It says this, John chapter 1, verse 10, the Son of God was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Now, that's, just, that's not just a case of mistaken identity. We didn't recognize him. No, because look what he says in the next verse, verse 11. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. See, it wasn't that they didn't just recognize him. They rejected him and casted him out. Why? Because they didn't like what they found. They didn't like the God who came to visit them. They were not interested. And this rejection of God, this was the apex of a history of humanity's rejection against God, right? This is just the crescendo of it. Ever since Adam and Eve first sinned, humanity gained a taste for sin, a thirst for sin, a propensity towards sin. And before you knew it, sin and rebellion towards God came as natural as breathing. It was part of our constitution and our natures. And this is a state of every single person that is born into this world. Without exception of every generation worldwide, that is the world. So when you read in John 3.16, that is the world that he's talking about. This humanity. So this is God's summary. Forget pop psychology and, and what they say look at God's description of us let me read Romans 1 what's God's description of the world furthermore quote since the world did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God God then gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done they have become filled with every kind of wickedness evil greed and depravity they're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters. They are insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless. They are ruthless. Or they, they knew God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. That's the world. That's God's summary. So it doesn't matter what psychology says, that is who people are. That is the world, a world that takes and takes the blessings of God that we need in this life. They take it and then they bite the hand that feeds them. They turn on him. The God who made them and provides says, obey my commandments. And humanity says, no. And God says, I am the Lord, you shall live for me. And humanity says to God, my will be done, not yours. Mine. This is the world who lives for money. They, you know this world, right? You live in it. This world loves the idea of heaven. They just don't want Jesus to be there when, when they arrive. A heaven without God. Heaven without worship. That is 
the world. And it's that world that John 3.16 says that God so loved. That world. That's the one that he loves. How could God love such people? His love is stunning when you think about it. And what makes it so special? He doesn't have just this collective kind of love for the world. You know when someone says, I love dogs. Now someone who says that, they haven't met every single dog on the planet. They don't personally know every dog on the planet. They just love dogs in general. It's a collective statement. They love dogs as a whole. But God's love is not like that. He doesn't love this world just in some kind of collective sense. No, when it says he loves the world, he loves all of the world. Every single one. Not one person is excluded. Not one person is left out of that statement. He loves them individually, by name. So do you realize when you read John 3.16, you can put your name in there. Insert your name. That's what he's getting at here. He loves each and every one of us. So he loves the world because he loves each person that makes up the world. That's what he's saying here. So that's love's surprising object, that God would love the world. Secondly, tonight, we see love's surprising gift. Love's surprising gift. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So here we see now the height of God's love. How high is his love? When we, you and me, when we're wronged, when someone wrongs us, when someone offends us, when someone slanders us and mistreats us, how do we respond? What do we do? We distance ourselves. We withdraw from them and we have no part with them anymore, right? If that's how you're going to treat me, we we part ways. That's it. What did God do for a people who repeatedly offended him, repeatedly wronged him? Wronged him? What did he do? When you read through history, when the people wronged him, God sent a prophet to call them back. You're going astray. You're not living as I commanded you. Come back, and I'm ready to take you back. They reject the prophet. So what does God do? He sends another one. Go call them back. Call them back to me. And another one. And another one. And another one ad nauseum and then God gives again what does he give not a sign he doesn't give them a sign he doesn't give more prophets he doesn't give more chances to humanity he doesn't give us more time because more chances and more time wouldn't fix us our problem goes way deeper what does he give he says he gave his one and only son Now, history is full of instances of extraordinary gifts that have been given. One in the scriptures. Remember Herod? So impressed with Herodias dancing for him. He says to her, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. For that dance, half of my kingdom, it's yours. You remember going back a number of years? Oprah, in one of her episodes, she surprised the whole audience with a brand new car. Every single person. I was reading recently, a celebrity bought their spouse for their 50th birthday in Ireland. In Ireland. Extraordinary gifts. What's the gift that God gives? The gift of his son. His son, the eternal, the royal son of God. That's what he gives. But that's strange because great and extraordinary gifts are money. They're great possessions. They're great things that sparkle. They're rare possessions. But God the Father gives his son to the world. Now, that word there, he gave, it's also translated as he delivered. He handed over. He put forward like this. He hands his son over. Why is that? Because the love gift that God gives meets its object's need. The love gift meets the need of the world. And that's why he gives his son We have wronged God. We were the offenders. We are guilty. And we lay open to his just punishment. We deserve it. We are the walking condemned. We are literally waiting to be sent to hell. Like like someone who's in a waiting room. 
being called in for their appointment. They're just waiting. That's the state of humanity, waiting to be summoned. We're guilty. This is, this is who we are. And it says God gave his only son. He put forward his son. He delivered him up. Why does he do it? He delivers his son so that the son may trade places with us. There's a trade, a substitution. The son is going to take the blame for all that the world has done. He's going to be punished for what the world has done. He is going to be condemned for the world that was condemned. I heard of a a story that happened long ago in the East of a family caught in a deadly famine. Deadly famine. Now, there was... The family was utterly starving. And the only way that they were able to gain food for them and and the children was to sell one of the children into slavery. That would be able to buy them some food to feed the kids. So one of the kids has to go. But as they contemplated that, they couldn't bear the thought, selling one of the children to feed the rest. But as they looked upon the children, they saw the pain that starvation begins to bring upon a little child. And so they start entertaining the idea. So the four little children are in front, sitting in front, and the husband and wife start looking and they start with the oldest. The one who made them parents, they consider him and they look at each other and they say, there's no way we could ever part with our firstborn. They move to the second child. And as they consider the second child, the mother stops the father and says, you can't give him. He is like a carbon copy of you. I could not bear to lose him because it would remind me of you every single time. So they move to the third child and the, and the father stops the wife this time and says, he is exactly like his mother. It would be to give away my mother, it would be to give away my wife as well. I'd rather die than lose him. So then they move to the fourth, the youngest, the one who's suffering the most under starvation. They can't do it. And so the parents decide they conclude it's rather better for all of us to starve and die than to sell one of these children to feed the rest. You can sympathize, right, with with their dilemma. Parents forced to make such a situation. God so loved us. He didn't just give one out of many of his sons. What does the text say? He gives his one and only son to die for us, to perish so that we don't have to perish. The only son, not one out of a million, he hands over his son. When, there's been a number of times when witnessing or evangelizing to Catholics or Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or even Muslims, and as you start talking about the gospel, about what God has done for us through Jesus, so many times, you've probably heard it too, the objection comes, that is such a cheap salvation. You say that Jesus just does everything and you just sit back. Nothing's required of you, just him, just just what he's done. And that's it, you all get to go to heaven. It's so cheap. Cheap? Cheap salvation? At what cost did it come? Is there any any greater cost than, than the salvation that we have received? Think about the father beholding his one and only son be crucified. Beholding the world that he sent his son to, mocking him, ridiculing him, slandering and blaspheming his son that he is love for all eternity. And then imagine the cost of the father punishing his son, judging and condemning his son, pouring out his anger, unleashing hell upon his son that we deserved. And the father does that to his only son. Cheap salvation? And imagine the son. Never did a thing wrong. Only ever pleased his beloved father. The only one without sin. Punished like an infidel. Like a criminal. Like a wretch. Like the only one who deserved to be sent to hell. And the son lays down his life for us. Cheap salvation? Nothing was costlier. Nothing ever will be costlier than this. And why did God do it? The text says, because he so loved the world. How much is in that tiny word, so? 
Humanity will soon will first discover the ends of space before they exhaust the love of God, before they mine the depths of God's love. Impossible, impossible. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Now, do not miss the order of that. God doesn't love us because Jesus has taken away all of our sin. Jesus took away all of our sin because God so loved us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. While we were sinners, he loved us. Love starts with God. So, Christian, when you begin to doubt the love of God, that he loves you, and, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you're grappling through that, take a trip back to Calvary, look at it very carefully, what happened on the cross, and everything that you see happening there, consider that happened because he loved me, because he loved me. So we've seen tonight the surprising object of God's love. We've seen the surprising gift of God's love. Thirdly, we see love's surprising call, love's surprising call. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. How is a love gift? of God to be received by this world. How do you benefit from it? What does it say? To all who believe. By believing. Why is this such glorious news? Why is it so wonderful? I want you to imagine that you are stranded in a desert. You are dying of thirst. You are on the brink of death and you've seen no one for days. And as you're trotting through that desert, you can't believe your eyes because you see a merchant with a little caravan and you walk up to him and he has a whole rack full of bottles of fresh water. It's as if your wildest dreams have come true. It is a miracle that has been sent down so that you will not die. And as you cannot believe your luck, your greatest need is met. But as you are rejoicing, your eye catches something. As you look at the bottles, you see a tag. You see a price tag. You've never seen so many zeros in your life. The thing that is to save you, you don't have the money to buy. You cannot afford it. And that thing that brought you so much hope and so much joy in the next breath became the source of your greatest misery. And you knew you were going to die. There was a story back of a man named Quincy Archibald. And he and his wife were living through the American recession. One Saturday, they took their son to his baseball game. And in the middle of the game, the son collapses on the field. They grab the son. They race him to the hospital. They get him to the hospital. And they find out that he has an enlarged heart. But the doctor gives him good news. Your son, he can be saved, needs a heart transplant, but he can be saved. We can do it. The family's over the moon. They cannot believe it. Their son is saved. But then the doctor clarifies, it's going to cost you $200,000 for the transplant. And it's going to be a $70,000 deposit just to get your name on the list for the next one. They're living through the recession. And on top of that, the father finds out that his insurance won't cover it. So in a moment, they know they can never make these funds. In a moment, their joy at their son being spared and being able to live in the very next breath, they find out their son's going to die because they can't afford what is necessary to save his life. You see, a way out for you and I, a way out of eternal punishment that we deserve. How can we afford the ticket? to such safety? How can you and I afford the ticket to escape hell? How can we do that? What, what are our dollars and cents to God? With what currency can you pay God? To what can you give the God who owns all things? And about those good works of yours? How are you going to impress the holy, holy, holy God who is perfect? With some good deeds? Impossible. Impossible. He's majestic. Do you see what's so wonderful about this news? What God offers, our greatest need, what he offers, he offers it completely 
free. Completely free. Absolutely free. Forgiveness and salvation is all of grace. It's a gift. It is a gift from him. And how does it become yours? You do not earn it like the Pharisees tried. You don't. You do not earn it like the Catholics who try with sacrament and rituals and good works. You do not earn it like the Muslim who's trying to keep the pillars of Islam to be somehow accepted to their God. No, 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 no. It says here, to all who believe. By believing, believing what God has done, what he has given, the gift of his son, Jesus, dying for our sins, being punished for what you did, for what I did, and Jesus being raised as the saviour of the world and as the Lord of history. Believing in that. But friends, what does believing look like? What does it look like? Believe simply means to have faith in, to put your trust in, to put your confidence in, to rely on. See, today too many take this word believe and all it means to them is some intellectual knowledge. How many people fill the seats in churches and they have this belief they can tell you that Jesus died for sins that he rose on the third day and that you can only be saved by believing it's not like other religions they can tell you all those things but it's just head knowledge to believe you have to have knowledge but it's more than just knowledge it is putting trust in some people with the smallest amount of knowledge have a strong faith and confidence in God as their savior and then you have some people who have all the knowledge in the world and they don't have a shred of faith and trust in Christ all the knowledge it is to rely on him what does it look like friends picture the sailor who is on the seas and the violent storm comes and his ship is shattered into a hundred pieces and he's thrown overboard into the storm and as the waves are buffeting him what is he doing he's looking he's looking he's looking to find something that's floating and his eye catches a crate Everything else is sinking except the crate. And his eyes take hold of it. And what does he do? With all of his might, he swims to that crate. And he grabs onto that crate. He knows if he holds onto that crate, if he takes a hold of that crate, he lives. But he knows if he lets that crate pass by, he's dead. It's all over. And you watch him take hold of that crate and put all of his weight, all of his confidence, the only thing that matters in the world is that crate and getting to it. Friends, when a person finally understands through the Bible that they are a sinner, that they're under the judgment of God, that they're in the waiting room, all the evidence is in, we're guilty, and punishment is coming. God's about to open the door into eternity. When that dawns upon a person and then they hear in the water, they see a crate floating. They see an ark. They swim to it. They jump in. They climb in. They cast all of their weight upon it. And they know, if that crate passes, I'm doomed. If I do not have Christ, I'll walk myself into hell. Because that's the only thing that can save me. He and he alone. And they put their complete trust in him. Friends, that is faith. For the first time, believing in something other than yourself and it's Christ and do you spot the breathtaking breadth of God's love what does it say whoever whoever believes will not perish this is the merciful offer of God it goes out to all without exception no one is excluded from this offer whoever I love that word I praise God for that word because that word includes me whoever it says here, people with shameful pasts and people with miserable present living. This includes everyone. I was reading Spurgeon and he recalls an event in history where there was a revolt in India by the rebels towards the government. A violent revolt. Eventually the queen of India, she sent out a proclamation to the villagers calling for peace and for pardon. And so a declaration was sent out to all the villagers. And she said this, lay down your weapons, put all of your weapons aside. On the day that I appoint, come to a meeting place. 
that I prescribe come to that meeting place on the day and I will give pardon to everyone who comes. There will be pardon. There will only be a few exceptions. And there it was. The thing that stopped the success of that event. She said that there would be exceptions to pardon. And so what happened? Many of the rebels didn't come. They didn't lay down their weapons. When they heard that there were exceptions, they knew for their crimes that they committed, those who took people's lives, they knew when they got there, they would be shot. And so they didn't come because of the exceptions. Friends, understand, with God, there are no exceptions, not a single one. He says, whoever believes, everyone is invited to this call for the Taliban. For the hypocrite who sits in church and has called himself a Christian for many years but does not live for him. For those with a dirty past. For those who are addicted to pornography. For those who are compulsive liars. There are no exceptions. Everyone is invited. Whoever believes. This is our God. This is our God. And this is the salvation that he offers to the world. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. So here, please understand, God, when he says whoever believes, he is cutting away every single excuse from humanity. Some of you may have come tonight because you wanted to witness a baptism or support a friend or whatever it is, but you weren't interested about all the rest of the night. That stuff doesn't matter. I'm here for a friend. God here tonight to you, he is cutting away every single excuse. And he says, this is for everyone. 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 Come and believe in my son and I will forgive you of your sins. There are no excuses. Please do not let pass by so wonderful and so glorious a saviour. Don't do it, please. Lastly, let me close with our final point. I'll be brief. Love's surprising reward. Love's surprising reward. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You heard tonight in the testimonies what the reward for sin is, right? What's the wage for sin? Punishment is death. You want to live in sin? That's the reward you get, death. Perishing means sentence to everlasting ruin. If you perish, what God is talking about here, it means you will be closed off from the love of God for all eternity. It means that time is coming when the door of God's mercy will be locked shut forever to you, never to be opened again. It is to be cut off from all hope. It is to be cast out into utter utter darkness forever. And it is to be thrown into the lake of fire. That's what it means to perish. There's no softer way of saying it. That's what Jesus said. For all those who perish. But that's not the reward that God offers us, is it? What's the reward? that those who believe will not perish. That's not what you're going to get. But what does he offer? But have eternal life. God holds back the reward for sin that we deserve and he holds out the reward of eternal life. You don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. And he offers us everlasting life. What do all the rewards in this world, on this earth, what do they all have in common? They're all temporal They're all fleeting. They all have expiry dates. They all have limited warranties. And even the things in this life that don't rust, one day you've got to pass it on to someone else. They're all fleeting. And so in a hollow world where things do not last, God offers something that will last, that transcends the grave, that you will never lose. What does he offer? Eternal life. He gives ever lasting life what is eternal life it is sins forgiven it is peace with god enemies are made sons you move from being under god's curse to being under his unending blessing like joseph you move from being a prisoner to princes you're made sons you get to live in the new heavens and the new earth where there's no more suffering no more sickness no more death you get to live in eden restored and extended a whole world of even All of that will be forever. You get reunited with Christians who've died that you miss so greatly. Christians throughout history are the greatest reunion the world's ever known. But what is the highlight of everlasting life? What is it? Eternal life. What's the highlight? 
Jesus tells us when he prays to his father in John chapter 17. What does he say? John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life. Okay, Jesus. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What is the great blessing of eternal life? You have a relationship with God. You know God and you get to live with him forever, forever and ever and ever with your creator, the one who loved you in your darkness. You get him and you get him forever. That is eternal life. So I close tonight. The essence of Christianity can be summed up in one verse. Love surprising object, a sinful world. Love surprising gift, God giving his one and only son for us. Love surprising call, you don't have the currency. God says it's just by believing. And love surprising reward, the wages of sin have been settled. You can have eternal life. What will you do with him tonight? What will you do? Christ reaches out. He's here tonight. What will you do? Do not let him pass by. Do not let him pass by. May the Lord bless you with his precious word and his gospel. Let me pray. Father, what you have done is beyond comprehension, is beyond description lord even the efforts of tonight how far short do they fall the extent and depths of the love that you have shown towards us the greatness of what you've done we can't even begin to understand the cost of the love that you have towards us we thank you that you bore the cost because we are helpless god we have nothing to offer, but you gave what is most precious, and we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for what you did in the lives of the people who profess faith in you tonight through baptism. We thank you for that, and we rejoice with them. But Lord God, we ask of you tonight that there may be others who say, I need that Jesus, and I need forgiveness. God, may you work on their hearts. This is your work. And this is your love, and it's your power, and it's your gift. May you be merciful, and may you save people tonight, that they might be rescued and come to know the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent the hope of the world. Thank you for saving these things in Scripture for us, in your word. And I pray you would bless your word to every single person in this room tonight. Thank you, Lord. Amen.